Hey guys, this is Jan for Chess24. Five rounds have been played in the first super tournament of the year, the Tata Steel Masters in Vikanze in Holland. And there were a couple of notable games in this fifth round of the tournament. Peter Swidler, in his video, will cover the game between Sam Shankland and Ding Liren. And I have decided to talk about the game between two players I know well, Jorn van Forest, the Dutch newcomer in this A group, the 19 year old in his first appearance against the world champion Magnus Carlsen. I know Jorn from being the coach for the Dutch national team at the Chess Olympiad where he played and Magnus I had the honor to be one of his helpers during his world championship match between him <laughs> obviously and Fabiano Caruana played in 2018. So let's see how that game developed Jorn with the white pieces goes for one e4 standing on one point out of four he stays true to his guns he pretty much always plays e4 and for Magnus this game had sort of special significance I would guess not only because he's facing the underdog we can see he's more than 200 points higher rated than his opponent but also because I guess he was very very motivated to break a streak or record that he's probably not too fond of. The world champion had drawn his last 21 tournament games, including 12 in the world championship match against Fabiano Caruana. And that seems to be longer than the longest draw streak by any of his compatriots. So today he clearly wanted action. And to get this action, he decides to repeat the opening that served him well in the world championship, the move 1c5 followed by two knight to c6. I was slightly surprised by it. I thought he would choose a move like 1g6 or 1d6 to try to get Jorn van Forest out of book at a very early stage. But he says, I believe in my weapons and I do believe that this will get me a double-edged game. From van Forest's perspective as the outsider, it's always a tricky question how you approach the opening against the big guns. Do you try to get a game and learn as much as you can from this chance of being in the Vikings AA group? Or do you maybe think, I have to stop the bleeding, I've lost the last two games, let's play something safe. Not that I would know exactly what this something safe is. Here, for example, he could play the Rosolimo like Fabiano Carana did in a couple of the games in the match. But that Carlsen also has shown that he is very capable of getting a game with the black pieces. Van Forest decides on the open Sicilian, 3d4, and after c takes d4, knight takes d4, Carlsen once again repeats his match weapon, the Sveshnikov as I call it, or Pelikan as it is sometimes referred to. In English, the move e5, weakening this d5 square, but forcing the white knight to go to a square it doesn't really want to go to on b5 threatening a check on d6. After knight db5, d6. This is where psychologically it gets interesting from Jordan van Forey's perspective, because white has a choice. The old and established main line here is a move bishop to g5, after which black plays a6, knight to a3 and b5. And white has a choice once again between two main lines, bishop takes f6, g takes f, and knight to d5, and the immediate knight to d5 b5 and knight to d5. Both these positions are very complicated but theory has been pretty far established here and it would be hard for the world champion to come up with any big surprises and if white wants he can make the game fairly dry here for example after the e7 takes takes c4 one of those lines white is very very solid so I was half expecting Jorn van Forest to go for one of those but he says no I want to play what I consider the most critical line here, the move that was also discussed in the World Championship match, the move 7 knight to d5, which honestly wasn't that popular in human chess at least before this match, because it was thought that after knight takes d5, e takes d, the move knight back to b8 gives black a fairly decent game, followed by bishop e7, short castles, and then an eventual f5. But Fabiano Carana showed some fresh ideas in the match which eventually 
made Magnus Carlsen change his move from knight to b8 to knight to e7, which is a line he repeats in this game. The knight on e7 stands a bit in the way of development, so it probably has to move again to g6 or f5, but of course once it makes it to one of those squares, it will be more actively placed for battle, especially on the king side, than it would be on b8 and d7. White should act quickly here, because if he waits too long, and black is allowed to play knight g6, but should be seven short castles in f5, he'll just have a good position. Therefore, he has to do something, and Falfores plays the most critical move. The move pawn to c4, which not only is part of the plan in the long term, where white would like to go b4 and c5, or just c5, under any circumstances to maybe create a pass pawn on the d file, but c4 also has the effect, as this arrow shows us, to open the way for the white queen to go to a4 and try to harass the black king a bit before black has completed his development. Knight to g6 is played, still known from the world championship match, where this position was debated twice. Fanfaris plays that move queen a4, threatening a check on c7, which should be addressed, therefore, bishop to d7, really the only sensible move and the white idea here is to immediately move the queen again before this pin becomes a problem after a6. Go queen to b4, now threatening knight takes d6 check and once again keeping black busy. On paper Carson has a choice here between the move he played in the first match game where this position features the move bishop to f5 and the move he would later play in the tiebreak in the match to move queen to b8 but I would guess he did not even consider bishop to f5 for this game because it does have one practical flaw, especially when playing against a lower rated opponent, that white can just repeat moves here by going queen to a4, once again threatening knight c7 check, and black has nothing better than returning when after queen b4 we would have the same position. And I'm fairly sure that Carlsen did not look for a quick move repetition and a 20 second draw in a row in this game. Therefore, he decides to play the alternative, queen b8, still familiar territory to him. He played this move in the tiebreak against Caruana as well. And asks white to show him what he's got, not too afraid of fun for his preparation. White still has to act quickly, once again. If black is allowed to play bishop e7 short castles, he'll be fine. So the way to make something happen here is the move h4. Planning, <coughs> apologies, to harass that knight by going pawn to h5. Black should stop that, and he does by playing h5 himself, which, however, is a concession, because now if you were to play f5 later, a move you very much want to play, this bishop gets access to the g5 square, that's one drawback. The other is that the pawn on h5 itself can become a target after bishop to e2, let's say black goes bishop e7 in short castles, the pawn will be hanging. And we'll see such themes later in the game. For now, Fanfaraise goes bishop to e3, continues development. Carlsen kicks the knight away with a6, knight back to c3. And this is the position where Carlsen plays the first new move, at least for him, of the game. He plays the move f7 to f5. Part of the plan in <coughs> sorry again. The match he played a6 to a5 chasing this queen away and gaining some space on the queen side, but that comes as a prize because after queen b3, a4, queen d1, this is what Caruana chose. This queen does target the h5 pawn and is arguably even better placed on d1 than it was on b4. The pawn on a4 could also be hanging in some lines, so not a big surprise that Carlsen deviates from his play here, does not play the move a5, but instead pawn to f5. Now it's decision time for white. His quite some logical moves at his disposal. One of them that has been played in practice before is the move g2 to g3, just strengthening the h4 pawn, making it a little harder maybe for black to advance with f5 to f4, and then having a look around, maybe playing bishop to e2 next. Another move that looks quite tempting to me is the move knight to a4, planning to jump to b6, <coughs> as soon as possible. Let's see if that helps. 
after which the game can get incredibly sharp. The line my computer indicates here is pawn to f4, harassing this bishop. The bishop stays on e3, and instead white counterattacks with bishop to d3, hitting the knight on g6. And here the best move is the nice little desperado. Knight takes h4, rook takes h4, f takes e3. With chaos on board, white is a check on g6, he can just recapture the pawn. The knight can still jump to b6, but the king side has also been opened, and black can organize counterplay pretty quickly with bishop to e7. So it would have been very interesting to see this position on the board, and now a move like knight to b6, or the recapture. But Van Forest decides not to embark in <coughs> to any of this craziness, but instead, after f5, he plays very sensible developing move, long castles, bringing his king into relative safety because the king really doesn't want to hang around on the king's side where black is well positioned to create an initiative by pushing his pawns. So long castles played, Carlson develops, goes bishop e7, now fun for race plays g3, just defending the pawn on h4, and castle king's side by the world champion. This move, as I mentioned before, has the drawback that after bishop to e2, the pawn on h5 lacks protection. Actually, it can't be defended by any normal means here. And black in this position really does not want to play the move f4. The bishop would just go away. We can see all he's achieved is weakening the light squares on this diagonal, while the pawn is still under attack. Instead, what black should do, and what Carlson does, is to prepare for this imminent capture you go e5 to e4, clearing a very, very nice square for the knight in the middle of the board, tending to meet bishop takes h5 with knight to e5. Bishop takes h5, still a very critical move here that was not played in the game. So let's have a brief look at what could happen. The knight would jump to e5, threatening a check on d3. So the bishop has to return to cover that check. And now Black should probably try to open the position of the white king on c1 by going b7 to b5. The computer, as you can see by the engine bar, somewhat favors white here, but over the board this does look fairly scary. Let's say c takes b5, a takes b5, opening the rook. White plays king b1, which looks very logical, covering that pawn on a2. You could think about the move bishop to d8, regrouping and introducing the idea of bishop to a5, chasing the queen away, and then maybe going b5 to b4. The position remains extremely messy. So Fanforest decides against all that. Let's back up. And does not take on h5. Instead, plays the move bishop to d4, directed against knight e5, which could now be captured. And maybe his idea was also to force the exchange of these bishops. Bishop f6 is played by Carlsen. So now this bishop at least can no longer go to d8 and a5 in these lines. Fanforis takes, rook takes, and this is a position where the features haven't changed that much, but the dark square bishops have disappeared. And I was expecting Jorn Fanforis to now capture the pawn on h5, but he maybe had a change of heart, I don't know. Maybe he decided the black initiative was too strong, and he once again does not take. Play would still remain extremely complicated. Knight e5, bishop e2 back, and b5. Let's say c takes b5, bishop takes b5. When the computer says this is close to equality, even though white is a pawn up, which is probably good news for black, it does have very nice looking compensation with this powerful knight on e5. But still, white had to play like this. At least he's a pawn up after a3. There is nothing direct that would happen to him, so the position would stay. Highly, highly complex. Instead, Fanforest decides to try to stop this advance b7 to b5 by putting his queen on b6 and making it harder for black to generate initiative. But the problem is that now he will just have a strategically somewhat tough position to play where he's not even a pawn up. The knight, of course, jumps to e5. And now it is too late to ever take on h5, because it would be very well met with knight d3 check or knight takes c4. So you can't take it. And it turns out that all of a sudden, 
the black position is much easier to play. He has a very strong plan, which we'll see next move. <coughs> <coughs> After king to b1, the bishop goes to e8, not only covering the pawn on h5, but also prepares to occupy the very nice square on g6, from where it would support the f4 advance by defending the e4 pawn, keeping an eye on the white king, and also just allowing the black pieces to operate much more freely, because we will see clearing the square on d7 also had another purpose. For white, it's very tough to do anything too constructive here. You don't really have pawn breaks on the king's side. f3 or g4 are sort of off the table, and manufacturing the c5 advance will also take some doing, because currently the queen doesn't have a lot of support on the queen side. Fanfarese plays rook to d2, tending maybe to bring this rook over to potentially support the c5 advance, and as we'll see in the game also, to clear the d1 square so that his knight or his bishop could, can use that to maneuver themselves to better squares. In this position, Carlsen, somewhat surprisingly for me, removes his knight from this ideal outpost on e5. I was expecting him to just continue with bishop to g6, with all the ideas mentioned before. But the world, what, the world, what the world champion wants to do is include his dormant pieces on the queen side. In the action first, by going knight d7, queen to d4. Computer, by the way, said queen e3 might have been better fighting as f4 advance, but it doesn't really change the nature of the position. So queen to d4, and now Carlsen takes the time to play queen to c7. Then <coughs> this rook is free to go to f8 or c8 as well. So all the black pieces now sort of know what their job is. The knight will return to e5. The bishop will go to g6, the rook will go to c8 or f8, and then the pawn breaks f4 or b5. We'll be in the air, well for white it's much harder to have a constructive plan here. Van for Reist decides to try to improve his knight's position from c3, bring that knight over to e3, from where it covers the c4 pawn, and is maybe dreaming to make it to its ideal square on f4 by going knight g2, knight f4. But we will see that this maneuver is too slow. And probably instead he should have stayed put, played something like rook to c1, rook, let's say rook c8, rook dc2, bishop to g6. West position remains unpleasant because once again it's black where the pawn breaks. But there is no direct breakthrough for black here, let's say queen to e3, and the game continues. After knight to d1, this knight returns to its perfect square on e5. But for race completes his maneuver with knight to e3. Nope, still something in my throat. Which doesn't look so bad at first sight. But the problem is that now black is ready to strike and open the position. And of course Magnus Carlsen with his very good sense for dynamics does not need much time to play the move f5 to f4, after which the white position might already be beyond repair. G takes f4, rook takes f4. We can see this pawn on f2 has become a problem and black has a very simple way of strengthening the position further by going bishop to g6, followed by rook a of 8, while for white it's very hard to suggest anything constructive. Knight g2 was possible keeping this pawn, but the rook just goes to f6 and the plan remains the same. Queen takes e4 is not really an option because of this pin. Said Jorn plays rook to g1, activating this rook, but after bishop g6 it becomes clear the rook will never really get a clear view of the g7 pawn. Well, the black plan remains the same. King to a1, going out of this diagonal. Here, black could already have taken on f2, but Carlsen feels his position is so dominant that he doesn't need to leave this rook maybe potentially hanging and calculate any lines. Instead, he just goes rook a of 8, preparing to capture on f2 in all comfort with the rook already defended. There's nothing 
good that white can do here anymore if he tries to cover the pawn with knight to d1. Black could take the other pawn on h4 or he could open another front with b5, indicating that c takes b5, queen c1, checkmate is a bit of a problem. So that doesn't help and generally the strategic battle has been lost here. Final race tries to generate some desperate play by going c4 to c5, maybe hoping to create a pass d pawn. But the problem is this doesn't generate much of a threat. And Carlson just calmly takes the pawn on f2, saying if you want to go cd6, queen d6, be my guest. This position still doesn't work for you. And he's right. Fanforace tries queen to c3 instead, but that only accelerates the end. Carlson now captures on c5, leaving him two pawns up. And the pass d pawn is not really compensation. It's actually not going anywhere. d7 could always be met by rook to d8. It turns out that there is also a tactical solution after d6. Carlson plays king h7, removing his king from any bishop c4 checks, and also preparing to meet d7 with a final knight jump, which is knight to f3. And this literally ends the game. Fanforez resigns here after realizing that, for example, d8, queen, rook takes d8, rook takes d8, knight takes g1, only leaves him three pawns down with no hope. So nothing to do there after knight f3, except resigning. None of the lines work, as you can easily confirm. Rook takes g6, knight takes d2, and the pawn once again. It's not really queening, while well, the white pieces just keep falling. So Jorn van Forest resigns, got outclassed by the world champion in this game. Two moments that he might look back with some regrets. One is not capturing this pawn on h5, either here or the next chance in this position, when black would still have a nice position, nice compensation, but at least white would be a pawn up and maybe this h-pawn could have done some damage. The other thing Funfrays might regret, but that's easy to say with hindsight, is his choice of opening. After knight d5, the structure becomes so unbalanced that the stronger player should be a big favorite here, while bishop to g5 left the game a bit more dry, but that's once again. Easier said, knowing the result, and also kudos to Jorn van Forest, who decided to play a full-fledged game and not go for the driest line he could find. Seemed like his spirits, at least after the game, were unbroken. He went on to tweet that, well, I guess you guys can read, forgot to go to the playing hall today and went to a chess lecture instead. On the positive side, it was a great lecture, so it feels like he's learned something. And let's face it, the main reason for me to do this video is to pluck at Jordan V for race Twitter account. We have ambitious goals to get him past 500 ASAP. The youngster spirits remain unbroken, even though the table now sees him in sole last place, one point out of five games, one victory against Jan Christoph Duda and four losses against some of the biggest guns chess has to offer. Agnes Carlsen will be Quite content, he's only half a point behind the leaders, has broken his streak of 21 consecutive draws and keeps every chance to win the Tata Steel Masters like he did last year, where he scored plus five, five more victories than defeats. That's it from my little highlight video. There's a rest day the day after this game was played, after round five. The action resumes on Friday the 18th with the games, if I recall correctly, Carlsen versus Mamed Yarov and Jorn van Forest versus Svidoseyev. If you guys want to, you can visit Super Grandmaster Peter Svidler and me on Chess24 behind the paywall with the code you see here. You get 30% off Chess24 subscription. Thank you so much for watching the video and see you guys around.